you again for meeting with me. Um, I have read uh, extensively the, the document, The Facts on Preventing uh, Protecting Yourself Aerosol Transmission. It has been the most helpful document to me as a community member of anything I found, a uh, publication document. And um, my work is with the Santa Fe Mediation Center. I'm a mediator, facilitator, and planner. I'm also a parent. And so through our in-community program, I've become very involved in helping parents advocate for their children at schools and helping schools collaborate with parents so that there's better preparation. Um, why I've asked you to speak is I see there's a lack of just some frank and easily accessible information. There's um, some density in a lot of what's put out. And there's also from places that are trying to dilute the information, it feels not clear. And so there are a few items that stand out for me in going through that document that I think would be very helpful to have in this kind of video presentation. Because for a lot of people, uh, printing up and reading a dense document is more than their life allows and trying to do something that's more easily accessible to many more people. I mean, that schools are still maybe needing information about, and, and I'd like to contextualize, schools are our unvaccinated population. You know, I've talked about the pandemic of the unvaccinated. Well, some have chosen that, but then the kids are just <laughs> no choice. Mm -hmm. So in this very unvaccinated population and this very congregate setting, the three items I'm looking at, uh, number one is PPE protective being the main operative word there. Um, and that, that'll be number one. Number two is about ACH and ways that these can be measured um, in a, with some maybe verbal directions, different than the detailed scientific paperwork. And the third is investigating shelters outdoors because there seems to be a challenge to make something protective enough that it's worth building and paying for while it's still actually quite ventilated. And, and I'll say more when we get to that one. What I have seen is that despite so much that's been said, what is unclear is the fit. Because what happened when they said, cover your face somehow, they're having trouble reeling that back to the precision we need to make these things work. So the Gap made a mask and Old Navy made a mask and Target has a mask and everyone just says mask, mask, mask. I would like to help people understand that there are elements that make this protective. Part of the confusion arises at the beginning of the pandemic, we thought we were getting infected either through our hands or through these droplets that were these projectiles that the person was launching into the other when they cough on your face or something like that. So then a mask was a parapet, so it didn't let you touch your face or intercepted these projectiles. Now the science has, has changed completely and now we know that we are breathing this virus in. And what we are wearing the masks for is they are a filter. So if the air that we breathe in and that we exhale passes through that filter, then the aerosols that contain the virus will stick to the filter and then they won't infect someone else, right? Or won't infect us. Now, so what makes a good mask? What makes good PPE? Three things. It's a material that's a good filter that when the air does go through it, the aerosols stick to it. Then that is breathable, that it doesn't oppose a lot of resistance to the flow of the air because otherwise it's hard, it's hard to, to wear it for a long time. And the third is the, the fit to the face, because even a very small gap that's like one or 2% of the area of the mask, half of the air that you breathe in or out will go through those gaps because it takes a lot less effort for the air to go there than to go through the, through the filter. So, and unfortunately, I, I agree with you, most of the masks I see around here in the community or in TV are, are, are poor, you know. Any mask is better than no mask, you know. Any, any poor mask you see may have an efficiency of 20 or 30%, and now it's 20% for what comes out, 20% for what goes in, and, and then if a person doesn't get infected, then they don't infect someone else. So they help a lot, but we could really do a lot better if we, if we use better masks, and especially if we fit them well to our face. But I agree that this is not being well explained. 
Thank you. Yes, because uh, schools in particular being so congregate and so close and the idea of social distancing with children is very, very challenging. Mm -hmm. But what could maybe be not so challenging is the clarity for parents that a mask fit matters. There's fit and filtration. The filtration education has also been poor. However, it seems like without having to do too much effort, fit could be better if that's understood. So I want to highlight what you just said, which was so important. Even a one to 2% gapage around the nose or around the cheeks or the chin, even one to 2% could have half of the air going through there because the air would follow the simplest pathway. And what is important with the masking is that the air go through the filter. Now there are various filters too, but go through the material of the mask. Yeah, you, you summarized it perfectly, better than I said it. Yes, and, and I stopped to say it very clearly because I, I feel like you gave us some very clear numbers to consider that mask fit will make a difference, especially when we're getting together every day, 20 kids in a room, etc. cetera. And, and it's free, right? You can say, you know, if we have the mask that we have, but we fit them better, we are winning and it doesn't cost us anymore. So I, I know many teachers who have made it an activity in class. It's like, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna look at the mask fit and of the mask, and maybe they tell the kids to bring several masks if they have several masks and then see, okay, which one fits better and you help your, your friends see which mask leaves less gaps. And you know, it, it, it's fun and they understand and it's very useful. I'm so glad you said this because I hadn't heard of that. And it, it gives some inspiration for teachers to make a lesson. And you're enlightening me because what I've been petitioning for is the education of the parents. But you're enlightening me that this could become a, a lesson plan. We could even help design one and make it public for teachers. A lesson plan of how to work with the kids and let them feel more ownership and empowerment about it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The, the ACH in a room, you know, one of the things I I think may have become a disservice. You could speak more to this. I'm seeing HEPA filters claiming a certain ACH. And what I'm seeing from you and your colleagues and, and others um, is that there has to be a, a, a more full ca calculation. I have read all your guides and even the calculator that's between CU and Harvard uh, with plug-in uh, options. Um, if, if you're talking to just me as a parent or a PTA, a parent teacher association, can you walk us through what we need to do to really check on six or more air changes per hour? So the PPE protects you from what you breathe. So you don't breathe too many virus, but you wanna reduce the amount of virus in the air. And you can do that mainly in two ways. One is you take that air that may have the virus and put it outdoors, that's ventilation. So you can open the windows a little bit, or you may have a ventilation system in the school or you can filter the air either through the, again, through the ventilation system of the school or with a HEPA filter, or actually with a box fan and some filters from Home Depot, you can make one of these Corsi Rosenthal boxes that are much cheaper and they work very well. Um, so either of those approaches. Now, and they complement each other, right? The key for ventilation is to measure carbon dioxide. So there are these, these measurements, for example, this is one of those portable meters, you know, it's battery operated, it's small, and every minute it tells you what the carbon dioxide is in the room. And it's easy to understand, you know, in outdoors, there is about 400 parts per million. In our breath, there is 40,000 parts per million, you know, so of every million molecules, 40,000 are CO2. So if I'm breathing in a room, and, and the, the ceiling and the walls are trapping that exhaled air, that CO2 level is gonna increase, it's gonna increase, right? Now let's imagine it's 4,000 per million in the school, which, which is commonly seen. That means that 10% of the air that the kids are breathing has already been inside someone else's lungs and it has come out, may have come out with the virus and now you're rebreathing it, right? So that's a dangerous situation. Now, if you make the CO2 be 800 parts per million, which is what CDC recommends, now you are lowering that fraction of air that you are rebreathing to 1% or less, and that's a lot safer. So, and that's really, you know, if you wanna measure ventilation, 
there are other ways and there are companies, but it, it's just complicated and expensive and it's not needed. It's really like with the CO2, you can do what you need. You know, so you can make it again a project for the for the older students, like a science project. And many schools have done this. And then they go spend five minutes in every classroom and very quickly you learn what you have to do to ventilate. Right? You don't need to spend a ton of money. Now for filtration, then either you get those commercial HEPA filters or the Corsi Rosenthal boxes. So the key there, well, there's a couple of keys. You have to be careful with the, the commercial filters because the, you know, with the pandemic, there is people taking advantage of the situation and, and they will sell you HEPA filters that have very low capacity, but they are very expensive. Or they have all these other bells and whistles, UV light or ions or plasmas that not, are not needed or could, they could even be dangerous, but they charge you more for it. So you just want a, a plain filter, either a HEPA filter or one of these other boxes. And, um, you know, the, the key here is that they need to be big enough for the space, right? And um, those filters, I mean, the commercial ones specify a number that is the CADR, the clean air delivery rate, right? And they will tell you, is this many cubic feet per hour? And what you want is that that number is several times the volume of your classroom, right? If something is doing I don't know, a thousand cubic feet per hour, you want the volume of your classroom to be smaller, or you want the filter to be able to, to be several times larger than the volume of your classroom. There is some obsession with HEPA filters, and again, a lot of marketing of HEPA 13, true HEPA, and this doesn't mean anything. The filters don't need to be HEPA. What matters is the, the cleaner delivery rate. So you can have filters that are like, like the ones you will put on your furnace, which are not as good as a HEPA. But if you have a big fan that keeps putting the air through them, eventually the virus is gonna be trapped. So these are called the Corsi, I, I, I know Corsi, the other name was Rosenthal, is a hyphen, Corsi Rosenthal box. Yeah, there are two people who have uh, pioneered this. And I did read about it. So I'll, I'll note that clearly for whoever's watching this video that it's very easy to find how to build them, the Corsi mm -hmm. Rosenthal boxes if you need a cheaper option. Uh, the CADR that you refer to, any filter, HEPA or not, that has good clout should be giving that rating. It should be telling us what that is. Yes, and uh, I believe that's that may be a legal requirement that the you know in the in the box when you buy a HEPA filter, it tells you the CADR is this much cubic feet per hour. Yeah, the the clean air delivery rate, and then you also said several times larger than the volume of the classroom, three, four, as long as it's more than two. So, um, I mean, ideally, you know, uh, this is where there is no absolutes, right? There is always gonna be some risk. The idea is to make the risk lower. It means you want these six air changes per hour. And that needs to be the sum of ventilation and filtration. So you can get three and three, two and four, four and two, or six and zero, zero and six, right? Now for the filtration one, the calculation is you say, okay, I have my cleaner delivery rate, which is in cubic feet per hour. And I want that number, if that number is three times the volume of my classroom, I'm getting three air changes per hour through filtration, right? And then I would wanna get the other ones through ventilation, right? Which would you do by keeping the CO2 low? You know, I see. and there are more technical calculations, but but I think if, if you do some combination of that, of having the filters that are big enough for the space and ventilating, you know, so the CO2 doesn't go very high, then that makes a relatively safe situation. And of course, then wearing masks on top of it. So we're checking the CADR of the filtration and we can check the ventilation by the CO2 monitor. Mm -hmm. um, how how much could a box fan blowing out an, a window add to ventilation? Um, a, a lot if if another window is open, right? If you have an, one window opening one side of the of the classroom, and then a fan on the other side, you will move a lot of air. In fact, um, I mean, colleagues in Spain in, in cities where it was very cold last winter, they went to a lot of schools and they measured CO two, and they found that in the typical school. All you needed to do to have good ventilation was to open three windows about seven inches each. 
in ideally on different sites and open the door and open, if you have multiple windows, open them in different sites so it creates more circulation. And that was enough to, to create in most places enough air circulation to have the CO2 be below 700 or something like that, right? So it wasn't, you know, if they opened the windows all the way, then the CO2 was very, very low, but they were really, really cold. While if they open three windows, seven inches, you know, instead of being at 70 degrees, they were at 62 degrees and they, they had to wear more of a sweater or whatever, but they were much safer. You know, so, so now if you put a, a box fan in a window, you can imagine that you are gonna get a lot more ventilation than if you just open the windows a little bit. So that will do a lot. That's what's wonderful about having a CO2 meter, you know, that then you, because otherwise it's like, well, people ask me these questions, if I do this and that, it's like, well, it's, it's impossible to know without being there because, because it's very different on a windy day, on a calm day, on the last floor of a building than on a, mm. on a building that's more boxed in by other buildings. You know, they, as, as, I mean, we have a qualitative sense of that, but to really have a quantitative sense, that's where the CO2 measurement is really useful. And then the windows could be adjusted on different days and even in a different moment by watching that meter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and as I was saying, like, like what they were doing in, in these schools that they made it a project for the students, they would go from classroom to classroom. And it quickly became boring because the days that were like the same meteorology, they had to do the same thing. And then if a day was really windy, then they could close and then they could measure again. And then if a day was really, really calm, maybe they need to open a little more. But basically, you know, it, it wasn't rocket science. Basically, the teachers could have some mark on the window, say, okay, windy day here, calm day here. You know, it, it wasn't very difficult. So the windows need to be open all the time. There, is, there was a lot of, there were a lot of people that what they wanted to do was to open the windows, completely ventilate and then close. Like maybe they had learned that from, from their mothers or something. But, that's not the way that works best. You wanna have them op open a little bit, but open all the time while you are sharing the air. There were also sometimes people were opening the windows before the kids arrive and after they left. That doesn't do anything. <laughs> you need to, you know, the idea is that there is one of the kids that's infected or the teacher is infected and is when they are there that you wanna do the ventilation. And one other thing about the filters, medical offices or different places, and they have the filters there, but they are off or they are, you know, there's one to four and they are at one because if you put them at four, they make more noise. But the CADR is when you put them at four, you know? So that, and, and actually the, the noise is actually an important specification, you know? So if you are considering filters for a school, they sometimes tell you how many decibels they make, but sometimes maybe it may be a good idea to buy one, see if it's very noisy. What about placement then? Does it, do they come with instructions or do you have a baseline to tell us about being on the side of the room versus the middle, which would feel inconvenient, but would it work better? As, as much in the middle as, it, as, it's, as it's feasible, you know, like sometimes it's not. What you don't want to do is put them in a corner. You know, if they're in a corner, sometimes what you can, what you can have is what's called some short circuiting, that they are kind of filtering and refiltering the air in that corner, but they are not filtering the air in the rest of the room. So in some other strategies, you have more than one, rather than have one big one, you maybe have three smaller ones and you put them in the front, in the middle and the back or something. You know, the, the degrees of risk I'm getting from every scientific minded person I talk to, and it makes complete sense when it's logical. I've taken on as a mom and a, a community facilitator to go to the nth degree of everything I can possibly control. And so the CDC said, except when you're napping or eating and shrug their shoulders. So part of what I'm doing is standing up and saying, that's, we can't shrug our shoulders. We have to find solutions. The outdoors, I've been participating quite a bit in these amazing initiatives, nationwide initiatives to help move classrooms outdoors. Uh, when it gets colder, Santa Fe will, but also I want to provide resource for places that are cold more than us. Um, I was warned, you know, watch out for outdoor structures because you may not get more ventilation. And when I started my research, I saw only articles about what didn't work. Restaurants did it all wrong last year. My thoughts went to, I'm not an engineer, but I'm just creative mind, how to make a roof like instead of buying a party tent, that's all clear, how to make a roof and a panel lower than the roof. So the roof is not flush with the wall. 
um, and also how to leave one side completely open. So for right now, my current design is three side with roof not flush with the wall. Uh, but anything you could advise these schools that are trying to build something or even going out and buying a party tent, how do we make sure we get enough protection but not reduce the ventilation? Certainly here, um, I've seen a lot of restaurants that have these things that are worse than indoors because they're so well sealed. It's like, oh my God, this is, this is how to make outdoors worse than indoors. Um, <laughs> right. the, what I'm trying to avoid and what I'm help, want to help schools avoid. Yeah, I mean, well, there's, people have done a lot of measurements and normally what, what my colleagues say is if you have one of those party tents, you need two sides open. That what would be the typical rule of thumb. And now if you are leaving one side partially open at the top, whatever, you know, that, that could be comparable, you know, but how do they determine that it two sides, you know, with one of these, you know, so, so you can do whatever you want and try your ideas, you know, that maybe it's more comfortable if you have, even if you have three sides, but you lower them a little bit, whatever, and then go and measure. It's like, okay, how are we doing with the CO2? And this, you will find the same thing that the day that's really windy, you can close things a little more because the wind is, is already gonna ventilate you better. A day that's very calm, you wanna open a little more, but but you can because it's also more comfortable. Right? Yeah, of course, you have to measure when, when the kids are there, when, when the place is, is occupied, right? The, there are times I've, I've seen people go to a restaurant and they say, look, the CO2 is very low and there is nobody in that structure. It's like, of course it's very low. <laughs> because we're all learning so many new things we never thought about before. So to just remember CO2 is dependent on how many people are breathing in the space at the time. And you want, you want them to have been there for a little bit, right? So, you, so again, it's like at the beginning, um, when people move in, at the beginning, you have the same as outdoors and we exhale, we exhale. One other thing is I, of those three sides, I'm designing one to be stable and the other two are curtain like shower curtain, they're able to move on a rod and secure or open. So what you just said is very relevant. On a windier day, uh, a lot of the ventilation will be taken care of by the wind, which helps us close it to protect from the wind. Mm -hmm. And maybe on a less windy day, if we feel comfortable with these drawback ones a little drawn. Mm -hmm. So even small gaps in a large panel, small gaps at the top or maybe in the middle, would move through quite a bit of air. It's not just this much air, correct? It, yeah, it depends. It depends kind of how big those gaps are relative to the to what's closed. Mm -hmm. And it depends on the 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 wind, you know, the, the even if it's not windy, you know, even if it doesn't feel like a windy day, there are days that are really still where, you know, and, and that those days you will need to open more and other days that you still don't feel it's windy, but the air is still moving. I would, I would strongly recommend if you don't have that, that you get one of these and, and use it as a, as a guide. Got it. Okay, we'll do that right away. Yeah, the only reason for asking in advance is we're trying to design and build. So we don't want to design and build something that just would be terrible. But, yeah. I, but I hear you that there is no secure answer until we test, and that makes sense. I mean, you, but, but as long as you have some adaptability, right? You have things that can be open or closed or whatever, then, then you can you can you can adapt it to as, as, as you see how well it's working right you, people like you can translate it better because i i understand it too well and i explain it too confusingly <laughs> but, you know. that's exactly what i've been working on thanks for your interest and for um for trying to help your community i mean this has been <laughs> I, I mean when it's been frustrating for all of us the the situation we're in but but you know you, you're doing the right thing so Thank and you. that's what I felt from you and your colleagues, too. When I discovered, it, I thought people who know are sharing with us, working hard to share with us just because they know and feel responsible, not because you get an award or you're the CDC or anything. Thanks a lot. OK, thank you, too. Many blessings. Oh.